Hi everyone and welcome back to GISC 126, Fundamentals of GIS. And then once again I'm your instructor, Brian Krause, and today we're going to explore what GIS is all about. So in the previous lecture video, I identified what a map is and the three types of maps and how they are beneficial in communicating information. So what is GIS? And is it simply a map? So a geographic information system, or GIS for short, lets us visualize, question, analyze, and interpret data to understand relationships, patterns, and trends. Because of this, there's much more than simply a map. So GIS is really important in the fact that we can do a lot of analysis and understanding spatial patterns. And that's kind of a lot of what the GIS we're going to be doing in this class consists of. So it also allows us the ability to capture data so we can collect data. We can store that data on our computer or on a server. We can manage that data by editing it and so forth, deleting it. We can query that data to find out information about it. Then we can kind of do some kind of analysis of that data. And then we can display this spatial information and make a map to convey some kind of findings. So a component of GIS includes the hardware, software, and the user. So spatial data are data that have a spatial component, which means that it's data that is connected to a place on the earth. So examples of spatial data include trees, rivers and water bodies, buildings, transportation networks, land use, crime locations, the location of where people live, and the example also is air temperature. It's close to the earth's surface, so it's something that we can record and that has a spatial component as well. So in short, any feature that has a location on the Earth's surface or close to it in the example of uh, air temperature is referred to as spatial data. So what is non-spatial data then? Well, non-spatial data is the descriptive of spatial data. So for example, your house has a location on the Earth's surface, so does spatial data. But the non-spatial data components of your home include the color of your house, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, the number of stories, if it's a single or two-story house, uh, does it have a pool or no pool? So these are non-spatial data. And so these components are considered attributes about your home, and they don't have a spatial component, so they are referred to as non-spatial data. So how do maps convey geographic or spatial data? So GIS conceptualizes the world as a set of layers. So each layer has a theme. And here we can see these various layers. So the top layer is imagery. Then we have elevation, transportation, addresses, boundaries, and so forth. So these are layers, and they are themes. So through layers, layers are the mechanism used to display geographic data sets in GIS. And you'll learn all about this as we go through the lab assignments. So GIS makes it possible to integrate data from multiple sources, for example, satellite data, which would be imagery, aerial photography maybe would be imagery as well, to some kinds of other types of data such as addresses, which we can collect people's home addresses, and use this data to analyze and model the real world. So the power of GIS comes from linking spatial data with attribute data. Again, like spatial data would be your home, attribute data would be the color of your house or the number of bedrooms. So why is the ability to link attribute data to spatial data so important? And this example will show you why. So here we have a table of all the counties by population per square mile for Idaho. This can be very useful information, 
but it's also very difficult to quickly and easily compare densities across counties, right? So if you want to figure out the population density in 2010, and you can look at each county, for example, Bonner County, it's kind of hard and difficult. And it's not going to get a very easy understanding of what is going on. But in this map, which shows population per square mile, you can quickly and easily show where population density is high or low, and we're using GIS, and we're able to link the data table on the left, the attribute table, to the map boundary, which is the counties, and we can quickly see. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So this map here is what type of map? We talked about it in the last video lecture. It's a choropleth map. So layers not only allow us to visualize the information, but we can also link spatial and non-spatial data and represent this information as a layer in GIS, which allows us to look at spatial pattern and perform spatial analysis. So here we'll look at this map, and this is from John Snow, and he is regarded as one of the founding fathers of modern epidemiology. So as London suffered a series of cholera outbreaks during the late 19th century, Snow theorized that cholera uh, reproduced in the human body and was spread through contaminated water. So this theory was in contradiction to the prevailing theory that disease was spread through miasma, which is through the air. So London's water supply system consisted of shallow public wells where people could pump their own water to carry home London to carry home. London's sewage system was even more ad hoc, where privies emptied into cesspools or cellars more often than directly into sewer pipes. So the pervasive stench of animal and human feces combined with rotting garbage made the miasm theory of disease seem very plausible. And so diseases were more prevented uh, prevalent in lower class neighborhoods because they stank more and because the uh, supposed moral depravity of the poor weakened were constitution were cons constituents and made more vulnerable to diseases. So in September of 1854, a cholera outbreak was centered in Soho district, which is close to Snow's house. And so Snow mapped the 13 public wells which are kind of hard to identify on this map, but they are the little circles in black. And all were the known cholera deaths around Soho. And noted that there's a spatial clustering of cases around one particular water pump on the southwest corner of the intersection of Broad, which was called Broad Street then, but is now called Broadwick Street in uh, Cambridge Street. He examined the water supply from various wells under a microscope and confirmed the presence of an unknown bacterium in the Broad Street sample. So despite strong skepticism from the local authorities, he had the pump handle removed from the Broad Street pump and the outbreak of cholera quickly subsided. So ultimately, Snow subsequently published a map that we're looking at here of this epidemic to support his theory. So a detailed um, of this map is shown here, and the complete map is, has 13 public wells, and each black line on this map represents a death of cholera, and there's 570 cholera deaths. So, John Snow, while an epidemiologist, used spatial thinking and mapping and analysis to derive this spatial pattern of identifying that the Broad Street pump had more deaths associated with that. So if Jon Snow perhaps was alive today, he could use GIS to perform this other kind of analysis where we draw a, from each, so the black squares are the pumps, the water pumps, and each of these red dots represents a cholera death. And by using GIS, we can draw the line from the cholera death to the sh closest pump location. And so you can quickly see that the closest pump to the most cholera deaths is the Broad Street. So it's much more clustered there. 
And so we can kind of quickly identify and see this spatial pattern that most of these deaths were probably resulting or are resulting from contaminated water from the Broad Street pump. So on that, this gives us a little overview of what GIS is and kind of how GIS could be used. Have a great day.